morning, everyone. Uh, can we turn the lights down a little bit, just because uh, this this is uh, this is not a riparian habitat. Uh, but this just kind of lets you know that, that the uh, Department of Ag, we're kind of we're a statewide organization. We were kind of concerned about noxious weeds in every environment. Uh, so, uh, and one of the things here is if you can't read this, uh, essentially it says, please don't make me eat the musk thistle. Um, but it's a uh, one of the things you probably have also recognized about the state of Colorado is that we have a new agricultural crop uh, that we've just approved by, uh, by a, a constitutional amendment uh, last year um, that uh, goes really well with my title. My title, uh, position title is State Weed Coordinator uh, in the state. And I've heard all the jokes, so you don't have to like, help me out with those. Um, but uh, just uh, as, a, as a start, um, I, I, I am kind of in my usual role of uh, being uh, opening act for Steve Sauer, so I will try not to upstage him or uh, or steal any of his, uh, of his notes, which I was looking at before the, the uh, presentation here. So, uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, a few things that may be uh, as relevant as possible to uh, this group, because I know that uh, you come from a lot of different states, and, and what happens in Colorado does not necessarily make your world go around. Uh, so. I'd like to talk a little bit about Russian olive management in the state. Uh, Russian olive has been uh, list B noxious weed in the state for a number of years, probably at least 15 years, but we haven't had uh, um, statewide management plans, uh, or by county statewide management plans uh, until very recently. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. And then second, uh, the Pooter Partnership, which is something that is not, there's a riparian component to it, but it's primarily uh, it has two different uh, goals, which may be of, of relevance to this, uh, this audience. So I'd like to talk a little bit about those. Uh, and then touch a bit on uh, our response to uh, the flooding that occurred on the Front Range about five months ago. Uh, and this is a new uh, world for us, trying to figure out where uh, all of those noxious weeds and all, of, and all the desirable plants as well also went uh, due to um, so real massive flooding events that we had uh, just a few months ago. And then touch a little bit about resources that are available for, uh, for folks who may want to learn more about uh, noxious weeds in, uh, in the state. So, so, starting with Russian olive management, and uh, uh, one of the comments that was pointed out to us in our rulemaking process was uh, that we did not have the hyphen between Russian and olive, and we were, that was pointed out as a grand faux pas in the botanical world. So um, I quickly rehyphenated everything in the rule and everything else because I forgot. And that's kind of an oversight on my part. But uh, the administrative rules are not really considered really exciting stuff for the most part. Uh, kind of put people to sleep. But one thing about the administrative rules uh, in Colorado is that this is where the management plans exist. So this is where they actually become uh, enforced, uh, enforceable. Uh, so uh, the, the rule that has uh, created the statewide management plans for Russian olive was just approved uh, just a few weeks ago and it will go into effect on March 30th. So this will be our first field season where we have, uh, where we have actually uh, we actually have management plans, and I'll show you a little bit about them. Uh, not too much, because I do understand that that's kind of a bureaucratic thing. But anyway, so um, our focus with the Russian olive, uh, our, our approach to it is not to try and attack the whole problem all at once, because we know this is going to be a long-term, uh, a long-term challenge. So what we decided to do is, is focus on riparian and associated pro populations right off because largely that's where they are for the most part, even though there are other um, spots that we're not going to uh, focus on quite yet, because this is gonna be a long-term expensive issue uh, and problem for us. And then also public open spaces, because we do have a fair amount of open space properties uh, in different municipalities and counties where there is a fair amount of Russian olive, and it, it's also a little bit easier to treat than say if you have mostly um, private lands uh, and there have been a number of counties in the state who have been working on Russian olive for quite a while. Uh, Yuma County with the Republican River project that's been going on for a number of years. Uh, Steve Sauer in, in Boulder County has been working on Russian olive for quite a while. 
and over here on the west slope a bit. So the primary goal here is now we have a strategy, now we need to find the resources, which uh, fortunately the Colorado Water Conservation Board has, has had some funding uh, in the last few years, and we may actually have a little funding from the legislature this year. Um, we decided to put off for a while a couple of areas, ornamental plantings for, the, uh, for one, uh, largely because Russian olive has been illegal to sell in Colorado for about 15 years now. So what we're hoping is that a lot of these, uh, the Russian olives that are in people's backyards are just going to die, and then they're not going to be able to re be replaced. Um, and or they are something that we can, uh, we can try to uh, do more of an educational outreach component with, with private landowners. That, uh, because when I was a kid, we had a Russian olive tree in the backyard, and you, when you have to mow under a Russian olive tree for like the first 10 years of your life, you grow up this seething hate for, for a particular tree. Uh, and that's a, it's not a hatred, it's just kind of like you get tired of having a bloody back after trying to mow under it. But, um, so ornamental plantings are, are something that we're going to put off for a little while. And then also windbreaks and, and, and some of the other cultivated trees such as are in uh, little town parks out in the plains and things like that, which are not a huge source of, of uh, uh, bird dispersal, uh, you know, certainly when you compare it to the, uh, uh, the riparian species, so populations. And we understand this is going to be long term and it's going to be expensive to do. I told Shannon I put in some Escalante River shots just for fun in here, so wherever Shannon is, here are the, here are the, here are the photos. Um, but I just wanted to show you a little bit, this is the Escalante River in Utah, and uh, it's kind of like what I did on my last spring vacation, but uh, it's a, uh, this is an area actually I've been going to for about 35 years now, which back when I was like two, um, actually a little older than that, but anyway, uh, it was, yeah, and th these are photos that you've all seen. Uh, of uh, certainly the whoops, certainly not that yet. Get back, back, back. Um, uh, where you can see the you know the hardened banks and everything. This is all stuff that you guys are really familiar with. Um, so that was a little bit of vacation shot. Now we're back to the uh, the management plans, which are there's, there's there's a text to them, and then there's also all the maps. So this is an example of how we've approached uh, management plans in. Uh, by in the Noxious Weed Act in Colorado is a county-centered act, so the counties do most of the work and it's organized at that level. Uh, so the management plans are by county. So you see here in Delta County, and right now we're about right over here in Grand Junction, just down US 50 here, and you can see that there is a suppression is kind of the goal from, de from Peony on the North Fork down to the main stem of the Gunnison, then where the Young Capagri comes in. And then the lower part of the Gunnison uh, is uh, some is an area that is in elimination, so this is an area that uh, they do believe they can get rid of any Russian olive, cause mainly because it's mostly tamarisk and Russian knapweed. But, uh, but then if you, you know, th these are areas that are going to take a little bit longer to, uh, to try and actually eliminate. So there's, we're just talking about suppression for, uh, for the initial term. But the rest of the county is essentially in an elimination zone, so all these other riparian areas the county believes that it can get rid of uh, Russian olive in these areas in 2022, and see that's that's the long-term nature of this uh, of this endeavor. A little bit further south, I uh, just wanted to give you a different um, take on some uh, rivers that you might be familiar with. This is the Dolores. Here, there's just a section in in San Miguel County, and then over here is the San Miguel, or these are act this is actually a tributary of the San Miguel. Um, just riparian for the most part, except for this area, but then you look down in Dolores, and this is an area that is much more widespread. So we tried to do these county by county, and, uh, uh, and it's a pretty long time frame. Okay, back to my summer vac or spring vacation. This is, uh, actually I threw in a little bit of Phragmites, because I know Mitch is going to talk about Phragmites here in a few minutes. Uh, and also this is, hello. <laughs> I'll talk louder and <laughs> did I turn it off? How did I do that? Well anyway, uh, so you get an idea of the uh, oh here we go. Perfect. Uh, get an idea of the uh, the hard banks here, you know, it gets kind of less and less fun as you get older trying to climb up and down the thing. So we 
get rid of the rest of them if you're really happy. Uh, and the channels, whoops, the channels aren't quite as deep as in some of the other, uh, uh, some of the some of the larger uh, uh, downstream stretches of the river. So that's it with uh, with tamarisk, uh, or excuse me, with Russian with uh, Russian olive, um, at least our strategies and stuff. And I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about uh, the Pooter partnership and what the Pooter partnership is all about. It has a riparian component to it, uh, but it it is also a uh, 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 it has a bit broader purpose. And the idea here is that it's a multi-agency, multi-year project. Uh, uh, that is focused, at least for the most part, uh, originally on, on fire-prone landscapes. Uh, one of the things about it is that it has both an institutional and an on-the-ground management goals. Uh, we have, we're, we're having two things that we're trying to accomplish here at two different levels. Uh, so to speak with, you know, to start with the goals that we have uh, is to develop a multi-agency collaboration. And the point of this is that, you know, Colorado ha probably has uh, less federal acres under, under federal management than a lot of western states, but we have about 25% of the state is managed by the Forest Service and a total federal uh, management of somewhere uh, above 30%. Not big for, compared to some states, but pretty substantial. And the idea here is that the different agencies, you know, oftentimes you'll end up with with, uh, with natural resources issues and more specifically with noxious weed issues that transcend boundaries and it becomes very challenging if, all you, if you have a boundary mentality. So what we've been trying to do is figure out ways where we can collabor collaboratively work across these boundaries, first of all, not only at the upper levels um, of the federal agencies, but also on the ground. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the general approach. But at the same time, we want to actually get something done on the ground too. We don't want to just have uh, a bunch of meetings and MOUs and stuff like that. We actually want to get things done on the ground. And then finally, actually, and, and finally provide outreach and education uh, to nearby residents and also public lands users. Here's a, uh, a photo of, or a, a map of the Poudre drainage. This is Rocky Mountain National Park right here. Uh, headwaters, this is all the collection area up in relatively high forest down to foothills. And then down here is the, from here on is actually dispersal where it's where, we, where the food is used for a lot of uh, uh, irrigation. Uh, this is the mouth of the canyon right here where the road up to Laramie is. Uh, and this has been kind of the focus of, of where, this, uh, where this project has been. This is the, the, the land tenure environment. So you get an idea of the complexity of what we're trying to accomplish here. Here's the mouth of the canyon down low. And you can see all the land ownership through here. Uh, this will go, this, the, this is the main stem of the Poudre River. And then this is the, uh, the North Fork. And you saw a picture of Seaman Reservoir a little bit earlier. The North Fork goes up this way. The Main Fork goes this way. You see there's all, there's uh, state federal, local, um, some municipality lands. This is city of Fort Collins lands here. Uh, state land board, there's very little BLM land, but it's right up there in that 80 acre parcel. But you get an idea of uh, all of the different entities that are involved, including a couple of big landowners. This is a big landowner down here, uh, a dairy that's been in the, the area for a long time. And then this is a different property up here that's intermixed with Forest Service. Uh, the gentleman here has is, is been somebody who has been very, uh, let's say, less than uh, friendly to, to government in general. And uh, he's, you know, they, they've been very, uh, uh, you know, antagonistic about anything involving, you know, putting limitations on their land and that sort of thing. That it's a very conservative attitude. But he found out that we were trying to do this uh, and, and get all together and try to find something out about cooperatively managing these weeds and he is on board. Uh, it's something that just shocked all of us and we're very happy that um, that occurred. So the partnership, just a few fundamentals. And this, is, this, this may be unique to the circumstance. So uh, one of the things is voluntary and formal. We, we did not go through the, the time to put it through MOUs, MOAs, cooperative agreements or of any time. We just decided to sit down and get together and do something. Um, it's ad hoc, which means there's specific limited things that we're trying to accomplish. It's not 
a grand overall strategy. It's not like it's a cooperative weed management area or anything. This is essentially we're coming together for a few purposes and we're going to see what works. Uh, INWIT, which is the interagency noxious weed team, is the steering committee. The noxious weed team is something that came together uh, probably almost 15, uh, not quite 20 years ago, by executive order of uh, the governor's office in Colorado. And they essentially said that all the state agencies need to sit down with all the federal agencies and figure out how to deal with noxious weed issues. Uh, that executive order expired a long time ago, but we are all still meeting uh, and we don't really feel the need to spend the time to try and re-up the MOU because it's working pretty much uh, as it is. We have an on the ground uh, group made up of essentially the local officials from these state and federal agencies plus local government. We have a, uh, the, the county here, this is the Larimer County Weed District, uh, is essentially they are the coordinators on the ground and, that, and that's something that we learned right away is that if you have a really, you have to have a really good on the ground presence at a local level and, and the county has uh, uh, been fantastic in this regard. Our idea was to use existing resources in year one, which is what we did last year. We're looking at year two this year and then three in the following year. And uh, we're, we're going to uh, be getting, we think, uh, some IPM money from, from uh, Colorado State University to do some education and outreach. Uh, we haven't got a couple of grants that we were hoping to get, but uh, we're, uh, we're just kind of, you know, kind of piecing this together as we go. Here's what it looks like on the ground. Uh, this is the non-riparian uh, component. Uh, you get an idea of the, of the, the scale of, of the problem before us here, uh, where the primary shrub right here is, this is mountain mahogany, which is the primary shrub in this, in this, uh, in this area. You can see it's been pretty well uh, torched by uh, fire. This is a fire that happened the year before. This is the, uh, the High Park fire. Uh, this area was also burned by the Hewlett Gulch fire, so it's been burned twice uh, in the last three years. Uh, so you get an idea of, you know, there are some, some really pretty healthy uh, uh, forbs that still exist, but for the most part, this is a Dalmatian toad flax uh, 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 moonscape almost. It's, a, it's, it's very impressive when, it's, when everything's flowering out there. So uh, one of our primary strategies was to, to use uh, biocontrol uh, to try and just start suppressing this, 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 these populations. And this is something that we had a lot of help from the Palisades Secretary, from Dan Dean and his staff, uh, and also uh, from APHIS uh, in both uh, Montana and Washington who were able to, uh, Dan called in I think a lot of favors and we got thousands and thousands of the sinus uh, stem weevils that we were able to start letting loose in this area. Uh, and this is, these are the areas that uh, we have, the release sites are in red, and then the monitoring sites so far are in the, the red with the yellow dots. Uh, and this is something that we had uh, done over the summer, uh, spring and summer last year, and we're pretty excited to see what's going to happen when we uh, go back this spring. Uh, even though the flood uh, that we'll get to in a second uh, did, did have, some, is going to make some, uh, for some changes. Here's an idea, this is just the extent of the, of the Dalmatian toad flax. It's, it's pretty much throughout, uh, it, and it goes for miles uh, in each direction. This is why we have to take the biocontrol approach. There's no way you can chemically treat this, uh, or uh, uh, you know, that would just be completely not worth the time. Um, so moving on to a third uh, topic, the, the front range flooding and, and noxious weeds. This is a uh, photo that was taken during the flood. This is right after it was, uh, we, we got enough, uh, enough ceiling that people could actually fly and take photographs. But this is last uh, September. This is the big Thompson drainage, which is a little bit south of where uh, we've been talking uh, previously. But, uh, and this is essentially the, the big Thompson River, which used to flow right through here, decided to take out uh, the, the road, which has actually been re repaired already, um, surprisingly enough. Uh, you may have seen some of these photos just because they went around a fair amount. Uh, this guy, this is up in Jamestown. Can you imagine just kind of driving your car home after work and parking it in your driveway and waking up in the morning and you're 10 feet above uh, this, this uh, pretty nasty raging river? Uh, and then these guys right here, they had a standing wave in their backyard 
right here. I, there weren't any kayakers around, but had they known, uh, I suppose that would have been kind of, but this is down actually in Hygiene, which is in the flatland area. So there's a lot of water movement even in flat, in, in flat areas. You get an idea here too of the scouring that went on, which is going to be a challenge for us because we do know where a lot of the noxious weed populations are in the in the foothills, uh, uh, mostly in, in Larimer and Boulder County, uh, and Jefferson, and then out into the uh, out into the plains. But you see here that you know this looks like a pretty well grounded uh, roadway here, and you see here this is this has been down cut 10 or 15 feet through here. So this is, the road's like much higher. Uh, this is, and then there's de deposition areas. There's just a lot of movement of soil and, and base. And also we're assuming an awful lot of uh, plant parks, uh, seeds and the seed bank for noxious weeds where we used to know where they are. Now we're gonna try and figure out where they went. Uh, this is probably a good place to look. <laughs> uh, this is the Poudre River right through here. Uh, but you can see this is a railroad bed where there's actually a waterfall through the railroad bed that's going down into the Poudre River. Uh, this is kind of during while it's still raining and then uh, as the sun came out a little bit later you could see what was left behind and this is what we're going to try and figure out. This is going to probably take us a fair amount of resources to try and figure out first of all what came down, the drainages that were up, uh, you know, coming out of, this is Rocky Mountain Park again, through here, and the Indian Peaks. So these are drainages that are, this is probably the, this might be the, the, the plat, or it could be the, I'm not really sure, this might be the Big Thompson right here. But this is out in the plains, out towards Greeley, and this is where a lot of the deposition areas are uh, from, the, from the floods, and this is something that we're gonna probably be spending, uh, the legislature has decided that, that uh, we need to spend uh, some money on uh, floods and fires, you know, and this is a, this is you know the flooding is going to be one thing where we're going to spend some money uh, granting it out to local entities to try and find out where these new populations may rise. And it's going to probably take a couple years because uh, you know, these things aren't going to all pop up this spring. Um, but uh, that's uh, what we're trying to uh, to accomplish here. So uh, just a few things uh, with regard to resources. Uh, the We've been working on our website uh, to try and put more and more stuff on it uh, as a resource to, be, to people. Uh, one of the things that we do have that's fairly obvious is uh, a way to connect people with their, their county weed programs. And this is something where, say, in Mesa County, I don't know if Melissa's here today. She, she might be stepping in and out. But, um, Melissa is the Mesa County Weed Supervisor. If you just roll over these different counties, the, the, the contact will pop up and you'll get an idea of who to contact. And this is kind of more for landowners uh, uh, and for state and federal uh, managers to try and know who their local uh, county contact uh, person is. Also on the website, we do have uh, descriptions of all the noxious weeds. These are some of our list B weeds. Uh, and then we also have uh, fact sheets uh, for each of these as well. Uh, we have, map, this is mapping of Russian olive. Look, notice there's not the hyphen. Uh, but there's, uh, this is, this is uh, data that we just got last year from the counties that shows a pretty good idea of where a lot of the Russian olive is in the, uh, in the state. You know, a lot of it is, you, know, the, you can see the riparian corridors, also the front range and, and then some of the corridors coming off of there. Uh, here's a fact sheet. Uh, this is the Russian olive one, which was, um, which was uh, finished up relatively soon, back before we realized that we need to have a hyphen there. And then um, I always like to kind of finish off with this really, really healthy tamarisk, uh, which is in the middle. This is all really healthy sagebrush everywhere. There's not a there's not a creek within 10 miles of here. Um, but the tamarisk is just having, having a good old ball. So it's a, this is out in uh, Park Valley, Utah, out in the northwest part of the state. So um, I think that's uh, all I wanted to chat about. If, there's, if we have time for questions or, or a couple, um, or if, you, uh, if I was so clear on everything that uh, you have no questions, or if it's so boring we need to move on to Steve so he can lighten things up a little bit. Um, any questions? Cool. We do okay. have a microphone for questions here. 
Make sure I want to hear. Yeah, that's what that's what we'll we'll be trying to trying to figure out where those uh, where if any we'll have new new uh, noxious weed populations. Okay, um, and for that, uh, where do you uh, see looking for a pre-flood um, data if, if that? Yeah, the pre-flood data that we that we have would be um, like for example, you know, Steve's got uh, mapping data from Boulder County. Uh, and you know some of the counties have really really good map, you know really well mapped noxious weed populations. So we know where they were. Now some of those areas, you know those those riparian populations of say leafy spurge and the pruder, that's all scoured to the ground. So those that leafy spurge isn't there anymore. But we're assuming it's going to be downstream somewhere. Uh, and if we have good mapping of where things are pre-flood, and that's that's a question. I mean some counties do, some counties maybe not so much. Um, then we'll be able to tell what moved in. Otherwise, you know, I think it's just going to be a matter of anecdotal uh, memory on the part of uh, the weed managers and the landowners. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much.